you know, almost at the tail end of the course, and I have one more topic which I will start today. And uh, the final exam, I expect it will probably be something like four or five questions. And uh, there will be one question on the topic that we're still going to cover, that's on stability. Uh, stability is already a concept that we have talked about before, um, but some of the techniques are going to be new to determine what stability is. Uh, so when completing this problem today, we will get a foot into the door in terms of understanding why some systems, even though the systems, unforced systems, uncontrolled systems are stable, when you put in a controller, it can become unstable. And how do we determine and how do we uh, control and sometimes uh, so that we don't get into an unstable regime. So the problem that we are talking about, yeah. Uh, I can I can respond if you have a question. I haven't looked at the quiz yet because I've been preparing for this talk. <laughs> It means, it's an, yeah, it means it's an unstable system. Okay. Even if you have one positive eigenvalue in a problem that has 10 eigenvalues, that's enough to make the system unstable. Because when you look at the solution, the solution is going to be e to the power lambda 1 t, e to the power lambda 2 t, e to the power lambda 3 t, superposition, summation of all that. Lambda 1 and lambda 2 have negative real parts, they will decay. But if lambda 3 has a positive real part, it will grow. You will not get a final value. That's another that's another catch. You should get it. Because you know there is a catch to the final value theorem. And the last catch is that none of the roots in the denominator can uh, can, can be in the positive negative again. One way or the other. So that makes the final value theorem inapplicable for the particular type of function. Okay? And um, How did you find the quiz? Yeah, fairer compared to the previous exam. <laughs> All right. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so we were looking at this three tank and series problem, and I anticipate something like this in the final exam that has all the components. So I could, the variations, examples of variations could be, I could put two heaters in tank one and tank two, but control the heater in tank two. Uh, tank one puts a constant amount of heat. Okay. Or put the sensor in something else, tank two. So you should be able to handle variations like that. Or I could make it an interacting system. What do I mean by that? I can connect tank one and tank two to the side at the bottom. Okay. So all these are possible variations on there. Um, so the main problem when you have something like this is there is a delay that is introduced between the time that you turn the heater on and the time that you sense the effect of the heater on the process because your sensor is located in an inappropriate place. Uh, these are more advanced topics that you will see in a graduate uh, control course. Sensor location, what is the best way to determine where you should locate the sensor or where you should apply uh, the control action, particularly in columns like heat exchanger, distillation columns, these become important issues because uh, the feed between the feed and the reflex, there could be 20 failures. So if you make a change in the feed, you may have to wait 20 minutes before you see the effect in the uh, reflex column. So if you're put, putting a temperature thermometer thermocouple in the reflex column and then trying to control it with the feed rate, there's going to be some delay, and the delay causes instability as we will see today. Okay? So in the last class, we went through the whole process of developing the fundamental models, linearizing it, even though it was a linear problem already, and uh, developing the types of function, building the block diagram. So what I'm going to do today is show you the block diagram, and then answer this is up to part C, I think we did. So B and E are the ones that we are going to do. Okay. Uh, <coughs> Set up a simulating simulation and play with different control parameters and study the response of the system. 
determine the effective transfer function in MATLAB okay, using symbolic toolbox. This would be by hand in an exam. Okay. So the process block diagram looks something like this. Okay. So you have three tanks in series, and those are the process transfer functions that you see here. 1 over 1, uh, 1 over s plus 1, 1 over 1 1.25 s plus 1, 1 over 1 1.5 s plus 1. And um, you have uh, a controller, which is a PID controller, uh, but we are told to use only P and B. We will see, we'll play with I also. And then you have a, um, a, a final control element gain, which is the one that adds the amount of heat. And this actually is part of the block diagram for the first process, because the first tank can take two inputs. One is the step change and the disturbance. Another one is the heater, the heat that enters the tank one in the form of uh, heat. Now, if I switch the heater to the second tank, the structure will change. You should think about those variations. Okay. Um, okay. And then the second part is the script, and we'll come back to that. But let me just start with MATLAB. Simulink uh, problem. So I've already built that Simulink model, and what I want to do is focus uh, on the types of responses and uh, changing the PID controller parameter and see how the response changes. Um, let's examine each one of those blocks. We can, you can understand what it is. Okay, in the left part you have TR, the set point for change, and then TR, the set uh, change for the load, and then the PID controller, the final controller, and the computer. And this is part of the transfer function of the short set. And this is the feedback loop. There's no delay in the feedback, so there is no uh, transfer function. This is just a sampling of the set point change. Okay. And uh, we need to set in the parameters. So if I open the control block for uh, here, I have used KC. I'm calling it as capital KC. So I need to define the symbol in MATLAB. And then KC over tau i and KC tau d. Now I picked, there is no PD block in our uh, simulator. There is a PID block. So you need to control to simulate PD by choosing these parameters carefully. And I think you are told to use uh, KC as equal to 3. KC is 3, and tau D is 0.5 minutes. Okay. Tau D is 0.5 minutes, and KC is 3 PSI per degree uh, Fahrenheit. So uh, how would I specify in such a way that I kill any integral action? So I go to the workspace and I define KC as equal to 3 and tau D as equal to 0 0.5. These are the numbers that are given and there is no integral action. Okay, But Simulink expects some number in there. So I'm going to put this as a very large number. Okay, and Let me just put 10,000. Okay. Now I have defined all the, yeah. Yeah. On, on this one, yeah. Uh, that's actually a good observation. I never thought about it. So this this allows you to put because we have always been writing the GC block as KC times. So we always write so. Oh, The transfer function, you, you, yeah, you know what I'm talking about, right? Kc times 1 plus uh, 1 over tau i uh, and then tau i s and then tau d s. So I'm trying to put the numbers in the same form into Simulink. But what we have observed is a good observation because you can actually specify i because it's in the numerator. You can put it as equal to 0. So you don't have to approximate it. That's what I think you are asking, right? 
So normally I would write GC as KC times 1 plus 1 over tau IS plus tau D. Okay. So, uh, and in the problem, the tau D and KC that are given are for this format. Okay. So I need to put Uh, KC and tau D in this form, but here I could put zero. That's what you are point, pointing out, right? That's a good observation. Yeah, I could put that. Uh, let me just put that and uh, do the simulation. And then when we uh, en enable the integral action, uh, we will come back and fix that. Okay, so I did the simulation and. Does that make sense to you? I made, okay, I should show you what I did. We were asked to look at step change. So TR has a unit step change. Here you know this. Okay. And TI has no excitation, no step change. Okay. So there is no disturbance, but there is a step change in the set point. Okay. So does this, does this, does this figure make sense? This is what you would expect. You would expect the control to have an offset. Okay, so in this case, the offset is between one and 0 0.8283 or something like that. Okay, the final study says 0 0.82 or 83. Okay. Um, now, if I ask you to kind of guess, would the temp this is the temperature from tank three? Would temperature from tank one and tank two be higher or lower than this at any given instant of time? Wow. While it is while it is going through this transit, while it's starting to heat up. Very good. So there will be points of time where they'll be going kind of in the opposite direction. Okay. But when you're starting the foot putting the step change, what would happen is you are adding a lot of heat into tank one. So it'll shoot up. But its effect will not be felt in tank three for a while because of the delay. Okay. So if you want to look at the plots, what do I need to do in the same graph? Uh, I'm just going to add two more inputs to that. Down so that I can sample okay. and I'm not good at these things. <laughs> Well, and I don't have a mouse. How do I go and go there? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I did it again. <laughs> um, you can see it, right? I have put a copy of this uh, single link. File. So we play with it afterwards. What happened? Something went wrong in the connection. I think I found the wrong connection. <laughs> and undo all of those and try one more time. From there. Oh, just try. This is not going to work. Um, 
Which one? Oh, 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 oh. Thank you. <laughs> okay, there it is. Okay, so you can see the yellow line is from uh, tank one, and then the purple is tank two, and the blue is tank three. So if, uh, another question to ask. These are the kind of thought process that you should kind of uh, engage yourself in. One question that we asked is, what happens if I have all three tanks replaced by equal and single tank? What would happen to the temperature? Typically, what happens to the tank constant? The larger the volume means, the larger the tank constant. Okay, so the response is going to take longer. And uh, the temperature will not shoot up because we have a lot more fluid to heat up. So you won't you won't see such a large shoot up that you see in tank one. Okay. Um, let's do play with the control parameters to get rid of that offset. I want to have an integral action, so I'm going to have Kc over tau i, and I'm going to put a tau i value that is meaningful now. Now you see that the offset is gone. The step changes from 0 to 1, the final shrink is going to be But it does take a uh, long time. Pardon me? Increase your case. Okay, that's a good question. So, can I increase KC to cut down the response time? Okay, so that is a task of a control engineer to tune the control parameters, the three parameters, so that you minimize these fluctuations if at all possible and uh, get this response as quickly as possible. Yeah. Uh, That's a very good observation. I was going to ask you that question, <laughs> and you asked me before I did. So that's an important. This is what I want all of you to kind of engage in, because what this is, this is all around a steady state. Okay. So even the heat duty will be normalized around the steady state. So you could find QS that the heat duty to be negative. Okay. And. Uh, You have to put a boundary on it because if the Q negative becomes so low that you're completely turning off and the controller says, no, you still need to take heat out, <laughs> you need a refrigeration there, right? Can you? Is it possible Okay, now you cut me off guard. I think it's possible. I think it's possible, but. If you ask me to show how, I won't be able to show it to you right now. Okay. But there are ways that you can, you can, because Simulink interfaces with MATLAB. Okay, so in MATLAB you can code almost anything that you want to do. So you can set up a limit in MATLAB. Yeah. Check. Yeah. This is what I was going to do and ask you the question to interpret the graph. But since you raised that question, what does it say? This is the heat duty. Okay. Um, and initially it is heating up, and then you see here it's going below this. Does that mean it is cooling? The answer is no, because it is already putting heat at the steady rate to maintain the outlet temperature at the steady state. You should be able to calculate what the steady heat duty is initially, because the whole thing is uh, linearized uh, or modeled around that deviation variable, that state. Okay? So just because this Q goes negative, it doesn't mean that you need refrigeration. It simply means you're going to reduce your heat below the steady state value. Okay? But if this goes so low, so you should know what is the load limit when you turn it off. 
and what will be the exit temperature. Okay. So if you are asking for a temperature that is below that, you can only achieve that by having a refrigeration system. Uh, this control system cannot achieve that. Okay. So the negative here doesn't mean that immediately you're going to refrigeration mode. You're just lowering the heat below the current steady state. Okay. This, this observation. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, yeah, in the valve kind of example, you would call it as a saturation. The valve cannot open completely. There is a maximum limit and there is a minimum limit. Okay. So when you have, for example, a proportional controller, we talked about this um, earlier. The proportional controller for a valve simply says the error is large. I'm going to open it up continuously, right? But there's the diagram for uh, the control action. Uh, which is a control action of the pressure versus the error it will be something like this, but with a saturation. The error is beyond that, they open the valve fully so that you cannot do anything more. Okay? Those things can be programmed into Simulink and into MATLAB so that you put a saturation on your control action. So in this case, that would be a very similar idea that uh, you're, you're re reached a limit below which you cannot uh, turn off the heater. We need to have a, actually a cooler. Okay. Any other questions? I think it is important that you see the connection between what we talked about earlier um, and every process equipment will have limits like this on its operation. And somebody suggested let's increase KC. Let's increase KC and see whether we are able to cut down on the response time. So I'm going to make Kc equal 25. <laughs> what would you classify this command? Unstable okay. So whenever, <laughs> whenever you have higher order systems, this is very possible. Particularly, we have sensor location at a different place and control location at a different place. And there's a lag between that. By simple tuning the controller parameter, you can switch it into an unstable mode. If you shut off the control system, the system would be stable. It will reach a new steady state. Okay? You increase your step change, it will reach a new steady state. The idea of controller is to get there quickly, but for this kind of a problem, you can actually, why does this happen physically? Come up with a physical explanation of what is happening so that you are adding more and more heat and the temperature keeps on going. <laughs> it's hard to phrase it, but I want to have a, I want all of you to have a picture of in your mind of when something like this can happen. We would call this, this a, always a technical term can explain, but you need to understand the meaning behind the technical term. Right? The technical term would be this would be out of phase. Okay. So what is happening here is um, in the third tank, for example, at a certain instant, the temperature is going down. That's where the sensor is. Okay. And the sensor says the temperature is going down, you put more heat. So you're putting heat in the first tank. So, so the first tank keeps on increasing in temperature. And by the time, it, so it's cycling between up and down. And this cycling, when it is out of phase, meaning when the third tank is reaching the maximum, the first tank is reaching the minimum. Okay? And the first, third tank is reaching the minimum, the first tank is reaching the maximum. They never are in sync. When that happens, you have a feedback that fuels this, uh, the lag. So that creates an unstable system. Now, mathematically, how do I de determine whether it is an unstable system? I can always come back and do a simulating simulation and say, OK, this is an unstable system. right? And now, the other question, this is where we need to refine our mathematical techniques, would be, I know when I put kc equal to 3, I have a stable system. When I put kc equal to 25, I just pick some number, it's an unstable system. So there is a value of kc in between where the system goes from 
stable to unstable. Where is that boundary? As a control engineer, I need to be able to identify that boundary so that I keep safety values below that value. Okay? And that's an important question. But those are the kind of questions that we are going to address from now on. Where is the stability boundary? From what you've known so far, how would you answer that question? Only a pair of imaginary rules. The real part should be zero. Okay, that's a very good. good. Okay, so here obviously you have at least pair of eigenvalues that have complex rules. That is the real part and an imaginary part. Imaginary part is the one that's giving you oscillation. Okay, the real part is the one that is a positive rule, so it's growing. The amplitude, as you can see, is growing with time. Okay, so there is a value of kc where it will remain constant. Amplitude will not grow, will not decay. That will be the neutrally stable system. Okay? And that happens when you have the eigenvalue as equal to the real part of the eigenvalue as equal to zero. Okay? So what you need to do is we need to reformulate the problem in such a way we make Kc as the unknown, we make the eigenvalue as zero, and ask the question, what is the value of Kc that makes the eigenvalue as zero? Solve that algebraic problem. Okay? And there are methods for doing that. Uh, one called the roots test, and the other one is Nyquist test. So we'll have several tests that we will see. But the basic idea is building on what we have already seen. What is instability? How is this triggered? And what is the stability bound? Okay. Um, any questions? Yeah. Yes. It will depend on all of them. It will depend on all three of them. So actually, the stability boundary is when we talk about we we'll need to have Kc on one axis, tau i on one axis, and tau d on one axis. Okay. So for each value of tau i and tau d, there will be a value of Kc above which it will become unstable. Then I change tau i and tau d a little bit more and find out where is that boundary is. So it could be a region in a three-dimensional space where the values of tau d, tau i, and Kc will result in a stable system. And outside of it will result in an unstable system. Okay. We are not going to go that far in this course because now it's a multi parameter search problem. Okay. So we will just learn the techniques of how to go about it so that in any one of the parameters you are able to identify the boundary. So I will, for example, give you KC is fixed, tau D is fixed, tau I, above which it becomes unstable, things like that. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so this gives you an idea how to probe using Simulink. It gives you visual results, and from which you can say something about instability, but it's to find out where the stability boundary for the system is going to be tedious, because you need to plug in the numbers and run the simulation again and again. You can do that, I guess, uh, in a MATLAB program called the Simulink. But let's go and answer the last question, which is, how do I find the stability the eigenvalues um, without using Simulink. Okay. Determine the effective transfer function using MATLAB symbolic toolbox and determine the stability of the closed loop system. Determine the stability of the closed loop system. Okay. So let me open up a script that I have. And uh, Let's see whether we can understand each one of the steps. Can you see it in the back? Okay, big enough? Okay. So first I'm clearing the workspace and then defining all the symbols I need. Tau, uh, tau I, A, K, C, G, C, G, P, S, and T. Okay. These are symbols. I'm defining them as uh, uh, symbols. Then uh, K, C is 2, tau I is 7.5, tau D is, I guess I just picked some numbers here. Um, and tau 1, tau 2, tau 3 are the time constants that you see here. Those are the time constants for the three <coughs> tank. And then um, kc, tau i, tau d are the parameters in the uh, controller. Okay. So I'm defining gp1, which is the transfer function for the first tank, transfer function for the second tank, and for the third tank. And gc, I'm defining gc in the standard way, which is kc times 1 plus 1 over tau i s plus tau d s. Okay. 
and GQ is the tensor function for the final control element, the heater, and uh, sorry, GH is the final control element. GQ is the conversion that goes with the first tank. So remember, the first tank has two inputs. One is Q, the other one is TI. So I need to have, when I come to line 10, up to this point, all I'm doing is inputting whatever is given to me in the top. Okay. When I come to line 10, I need to have the block diagram developed. Okay. So here I'm defining G as GC times GQ times GH times GP1, GP2, GP3. So what is that? If I go back to this, it is basically the product of all the transfer functions in the loop. Okay. That is G. Yeah, question. Uh, G Q point zero zero four. Yeah, let me show you where it is. That is this type of function. Let's see here. Okay. So this is G Q and this is G H and this is G C and G P one, G P two, G P three. Okay. Now, if you have a transfer function in the return path uh, for the measuring element, you should take the product of that as well. Okay. And the effective transfer function between the output and the input, PR, okay, is going to be all the transfer functions in the open loop path between the front and the back, between the input and the output, divided by one plus that. Okay? So that is the next line in the code. Okay? G effective is G divided by one plus G. And all I'm doing is like simplifying the particular expression. And maybe let me set up uh, a breakpoint and uh, run the script. Any questions on the script so far? Yeah. Uh, right now, all I'm doing is finding an effective transfer function between the output and the step change. Now, if I ask you to find the effective transfer function between the output and the disturbance, then what would change? Let's go back to this. If it is between the output and the disturbance, the effective transfer function should be GP1 times GP2 times GP3 divided by 1 plus G. That G is the product of everything. Okay? So that will be different. So in this particular problem, we have looked at only the uh, Input and the step change, step point change. Okay. Any questions? Oh, you guys should get used to this MATLAB because it's so so easy, so powerful. When you're doing this in an exam, you need to know how to write the code, right? And that's where the problem is. If you're not fluent in the language, then that may be the frustrating point. But once you get used to it, this can be done in two or three minutes, whereas if you're doing it by hand, to do all the algebraic manipulations will take you a very long time. Um, so I would encourage you to play with this as much as you can. And when you get an opportunity, uh, play with these uh, tools. So let's just run this and look at, and I'm going to, before I show you this, I'm going to ask you a question. Now, notice carefully, KC is 2, tau i is 7.5, tau d is 0.1. Okay. What would be the order of the effective transfer function that I get? And put up that block diagram. So you have three first order transfer functions, process transfer function. And then there are two constants here, 500 and 0 0.004. Okay. And then you have GC, <coughs> the controller which includes the PID control of all three of them. Five, four. <laughs> we will find out from MATLAB. Okay, I just want you to kind of mentally be alert to possibilities like this so that when you do it in an exam, you can Okay, it has stopped here. Yeah? Let's look at uh, E. Okay. for me. Yeah. 
So in the numerator, you have 3 s square plus 30 s plus 4. Okay. Where is that s square coming from? Because GC, yeah, exactly. GC has a constant plus 1 over tau s plus tau ds. So when you take that multiply growth by s, you're going to get an s square from there. Okay. And in the denominator, you get a fourth degree. You see it now, okay? So the next line, do you have a question? Uh, I guess you guessed it right, right? So Why? Uh, you, you, you need to, okay, let me. Basically, you have g divided by 1 plus g, okay? So that's going to be equal to uh, uh, Kc times 1 plus 1 over tau s plus tau ds plus some constant multiplied by uh, tau 1s plus 1, tau 2s plus 1, uh, tau 3s plus 1. That is G, that is the product, divided by 1 plus the same thing, Kc times 1 plus 1 over tau y s tau d s multiplied by tau 1 s plus 1, etc. tau 3 s plus 1. So all you're doing is you're simplifying this by taking the common factor, okay? So if you Multiply throughout by tau i s, and there is a tau d s there. Okay, so it's going to give you kc times tau i s plus one plus tau d tau i s square multiplied by these factors divided by one plus kc tau i s plus one plus tau d s square multiplied by the same factor here. Okay, so that gives you uh, what is that give you? The quadratic here and the cubic there. Right? The product and then the denominator also you have the same thing, the quadratic here and the cubic there. But you'll also have tau i s here because you're multiplying throughout by tau i s. How does that simplify to a quadratic denominator? Oh, uh, Sorry, I made a mistake. I made a mistake. You can't. Nobody catches it. One over. That's the mistake I made. It's not just tau. This is one over. All of them is one over. Okay, to the power minus one. Okay. Now you need to do the multiplication of tau one s, tau two s, tau three s. Okay. So this is the minus one, and then you do the multiplication. So that's going to be equal to some constant times tau i s plus 1 plus tau i tau d s square. Because I have 1 over now, I need to multiply through all. So that's, that's the one. When I do that, I will, I can multiply both numerator and denominator by that factor, okay? So that will cancel the numerator and the denominator. But here, I will have tau i s multiplied by tau 1 s plus 1, tau 2 s plus 1, tau 3 s plus 1, plus this kc times tau i s 
plus 1 plus tau d s square. Oops. Did I do this? Tau d s square. Okay, do you follow up that manipulation? Because I, I had a mistake there. The transfer functions are 1 over. So I need to multiply both numerator and denominator by the inverse of that. Okay, and that cancels this, but it gives you a product in the first term. So the numerator I get only a quadratic, and the denominator I get a cubic here plus a tau y s, a fourth order effectively. Okay, so it is to avoid these kinds of errors. I encourage you to do MATLAB. Um, so in the MATLAB. Workspace, I have this uh, effective transfer function. You can now apply a step change or an impulse change in MATLAB code. Um, but the question is find the stability. Find the stability. Okay. In order to find the stability, what do I need to do? I need to look at the roots of the denominator. Okay. Because what I what I have is an effective transfer function here. So when I do like I have a quadratic in the numerator and the fourth power in the denominator, what do I have to do next if I'm doing it by hand in an exam? I need to do partial fractions. Okay? So when I do partial fractions, I'm going to get four terms. Each one will have one over s plus a one, one over s plus a two, one over s plus a three, etc. So it is those roots of the denominator that become the eigenvalue. That is the point I wanted you to get at in the second midterm, the assignment. And the quiz. Okay, so by now you should understand that the roots of this one plus g. The rest of the course is going to be focused on that. We will set one plus g equal to zero, so we get a polynomial, and we solve for the roots of those polynomials, and those roots will depend on kc, the magnitude of kc. Why? Because kc enters into forming this g, g effective. Okay, here it is, kc. So if I change the value of kc, the g will be different for each case. So what I'm doing next is I'm analyzing that effective transfer function. There is a function called num then, which extracts the numerator and denominator of a polynomial. So if I step through that, I'm going to get the numerator as a second degree polynomial, the denominator as a fourth degree polynomial. Then I pass the denominator to the solve to get the roots. And the next one, I'm just taking those, the roots are still symbolic, so I'm taking those roots. If I type, for example, roots, I will look at the value. Four roots are there, but since it's done symbolically, it looks like a huge expression. Okay, so the next thing I did in the code is to pass through the variable precision statement. What is that? And that one I didn't put a semicolon so that it will print out what the roots are. So if you go to the workspace, you will find those two values. So what does that tell you? There are four roots. All of them have negative real parts. Okay. And then remember, in the, the last one, these are the real parts. And the imaginary part is this. So that tells you the frequency of oscillation. So 1.09 would roughly be the frequency of the sine wave, so the oscillations that you see there. So the next thing to do would be, as a control engineer, to take hold of this program and change these KC values. So we already saw, for example, when I put KC equal to 25, what happened. Okay. So let's just uh, save that and run it again. Right, so when I save that, it would reset the debug. Because I just went through that very quickly. But whenever I save it, it abandons the previous debug, and then starts a new one. And when I hit the run command, it runs it and stops there. So this will be for the value of kc equals 25. Is that your question? And in the bottom part, part of the code, I'm just plotting that. But all I'm interested in is this. What do you see here? Positive rail part. See, this is what we saw in Simulink, 
But now with MATLAB, we are able to see that two of the roots have possible name files. This was the reward, and we call this a unstable mode. So in a three-dimensional, a four-dimensional problem, there are two unstable modes. It's a terminology that is used. Okay? Two simply meaning two eigenvalues have positive real size. They've crossed the uh, axis, uh, imaginary axis to the right. And this has happened somewhere in between. So if I give you this code and then say find me the value of kz where it is exactly zero, what would you do? Guess and check, guess and check, right? Have you seen this method called bisection method in your numerical method school? <laughs> All you have to do is guess k is equal to 2, k is equal to 25. The next guess would be exactly halfway between. Okay, 27 divided by 2, uh, 13.5, something like that. And see whether it is on the negative side or the positive side. You can solve it on LSP. You don't even have to solve it. Okay, there are some rules that will tell you. In fact, we'll see the root criterion, which simply says what are the coefficients of the polynomials. By doing some simple calculations on the coefficients of the polynomials, we can determine where the roots are, where the roots are going to move. Okay, whether the roots are whether, whether there are any positive roots. Okay, so that's next on the agenda. We're going to develop certain tools that will allow us to track the movement of these eigenvalues as they change kc or tau i or tau d. Okay, any questions? Okay, that would be the last part of this course that we need to understand. How is, what is the relationship between control, control of parameters and the stability of it? I think that's all this problem is about. Um, so we will start the next topic which should be to look at stability of control systems. Okay. Um, almost out of time. So here is a typical feedback uh, control loop, and we know how to get the effective transfer function, for example, between the output C and the set point R in this case. Okay. And there is uh, a measurement delay in the feedback loop, this indicated by H. So the effective transfer function in this particular diagram is going to be uh, G1, G2. Okay. So G1 and G2 are in the forward path between R to the set point and C. And they're divided by 1 plus U and H. And this is the kind of computer where I made a mistake if I didn't write it as over the whole set. Right like that and simplify it, you will get a polynomial in both the numerator and denominator. Okay, and you will see here the logic behind why the polynomial denominator is uh, okay. And then the stability of the system is determined by the roots of this polynomial, including the okay, I'm looking at only a proportional controller. And the idea that I want to show is, <coughs> is as you change Kc, the polynomials, the roots of the polynomial in the denominator are going to change. Okay, so we need to find that value of Kc that keeps the real part of those roots in the negative uh, domain for stability. Okay, and we'll stop there and uh, pick it up. <coughs> Thank you.